Maybe I'm not. It is okay usually without me. TA is the five year old. Any question? Schedule. Uh, the coverage of exam will be everything treated in the class, including video material. Presentations, PPT, covered inside class. You can use your note. Only thing I I can allow you is a discussion with your friend through some SNS. Anything can you can use ChatGPT. The other time I found that some students answered using ChatGPT. Well, I found finally that he does not get good grade. We can try. Yeah. Any other question? And no. we can start with the uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. um, one. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Si Young of Group 1. Uh, today I'll talk about the, the song project of Group 1. My, uh, our title is the design of a Korean light aircraft carrier powered by electrification and the renewable energy. The content is follows. So I want to talk about the introduction first. And next is our objective of the song project and the timeline and the job locations. Okay, uh, this is the introduction. Uh, for now, the South Korea Navy operates the Dokdoham and Baradoham, which includes in the category refers to LPH, the landing platform mm -hmm. helicopter ships. So as you can see in the figure, left is the Dokdoham and the right one is the Baradoham. So uh, you can see in this figure, uh, it contains the takeoff platform from the helicopter, but there's no the platform for the the jet plane, like the F-16, F-15, something. So following these two, now the South Korea plans to uh, proceed with the large transport stream two project. And this project aims to the operate 16 f 35 b class aircraft by 2030. So as we can, as, as we know in this line, uh, South Korea recognized the necessity of introducing an aircraft carrier Due to the growing military threats, like the, from the North Korea or even China and Japan, and also uh, in defense times in U.S., uh, they introduced some forecasts about the uh, Northeast Asia carrier uh, aircraft carriers 2040. Uh, it predicts that uh, by 2040, uh, China will lead with six aircraft carriers, while Japan and South Korea will follow with two and one. So it means that they predict like uh, by 2040. Uh, South Korea will make the some aircraft carriers. So this is the question: uh, Why South Korea need aircraft carriers? Uh, there's a lots of reasons. So first one is the strategic 
uh, flexibility. So can there be enhanced uh, operational flexibility for projecting electric power at the ocean? And number two, uh, it's about the uh, uh, North Korean threats. The carrier threat will strengthen the response capability against North Korean provocation. The third one is because of the regional complexities. Uh, as I mentioned before, China and Japan already have the aircraft carriers and they will also expand the carrier fleet. So uh, we thought that the Korean needs to stay competitive. And number four is because of the maritime conflict. The aircraft carriers play a crucial role in the control of large maritime areas that we near the Korean oceans. The last one is because of the allied cooperation. Uh, as you guys know, South Korea has the military cooperation with the US and other countries. So aircraft carriers, uh, it will improve the operational coordination with the allies like the USA and something other countries in the joint mission in any way. So, uh, South Korea recognized the necessity of an aircraft carriers, and on August 10, 22, uh, the introduction of the aircraft carrier was officially confirmed. So, in the part of the 2021 to 2025 defense midterm plan, and this aircraft carriers plan's name is PBX project, but this project is currently, uh, currently uh, suspended. This because of the change of the, the policy, government policy by the President Yu. So to help you guys understanding about the aircraft carriers, the CVS, I bring some videos. The name is Expected Plan CG videos about the CVS project by BC. Let's see. see uh, there's a difference between the Utuham and Maradoham. You can see the, the F-35B, the jet plane, and not only the helicopters, and also we can see the ski jump takeoff platform in the aircraft carriers. So uh, to find the suitability of the light aircraft carriers for the Korea, we need to research about the worldwide aircraft carriers comparison. So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of types models around the world, but those eight is the representative model. So the first one is the Gerald R. Ford and Linus class from USA. Uh, they have the nuclear power propulsion system. And also, and also Charles de Gaulle from France also have the nuclear power propulsion. And uh, you can see the Queen Elizabeth by UK, Liaoning from China, Kuznetsov from Russia, Kabor from Italy, Vikramaditya, India, and the uh, uh, Asturias Quest in Espanol, Spain. So these six uh, didn't have the nuclear power proportion, and they used a conventional thing like a gas or steam turbine and diesel engines. So this picture shows the nuclear, combined nuclear and gas proportion system for the carriers and the ships. 
uh, as you guys know, the nuclear propulsion offers many advantages, like uh, limited range, power, high power outputs, and efficiency compared to the like the diesel and steam turbine. But uh, as you can see in the red box, the Korea. Uh, since uh, 1975, the South Korea has been a member of the NPT, which refers to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of the Nuclear Weapons. So it means uh, that it restricts the use of the nuclear technology for the military purposes. So the South Korea faces difficulties to make the nuclear-powered warship or even submarines. So for now, the including weapons and the propulsion system is restricted. In restricted in Korea. So next is our objective of the term project. So next question, uh, what is the most suitable propulsion system for the Korean light aircraft carriers? So as you can see, there's a lot of combined the propulsion system, the CODAD, the combined diesel and diesel, GAG, gas turbine and gas turbine, GOG, gas turbine or gas turbine, and DAG, DOG also. Uh, following this, we uh, figure out the COD LOG, call block system. It means the combined diesel, electric, electricity, or gas, and gas turbine. So it means like uh, they have uh, power outputs with the electric motors in the main, and they also use the gas turbine for the auxiliary power. So it's similar to the principle of the hybrid cars on the road nowadays. So uh, in researching about the cold block system, uh, we found some the ships in the warship in the Korea, the Daegu class frigate. Uh, it, this ship already used this cold block system for the proportions. So this cold block system offers uh, lots of advantages. So it's like a uh, high torque and consistent power outputs because of the use of the motor, electric motors. And uh, they use the fuel mechanical connections. It means uh, leading to improved reliability of the mechanical systems and the reduced noise. And next, uh, they also improve the fuel efficiency due to the flexible operations. But uh, this cold block system also has the backside of disadvantages. Uh, they still use the diesel engine for the power proportion and also the gas turbine. So uh, this is our objective. Uh, we decided to combine with the cold block system without the accelerated gas turbine and the fewer diesel generator with the renewable energy-based cell power generation system. Uh, for combining this, uh, we guess that we uh, get the, this advantage like this. So first, uh, consistent and high power outputs. It makes the improved manual ability in the operations and the it makes the less noise compared to the conventional proportion like diesel and the gas turbine. It makes the quiet operations. So we thought the quiet operation is the suitable for the military, the operation and the missions. And next, the higher efficiency and compared to the turbines, it makes the reduced operation costs. And next is the in increased uh, cruising range through self power generations. It makes the long-term operation uh, the long-term op operation, we thought this is the best part of our objective. It is, it's because the long-term operations have to the, the suitable for the carrier's operations. And next is the electrification. It makes the expandability of the military equipment. Uh, as you guys know, even ships and tank and other military vehicles, they use a lot of military equipment powered by the electricity. So if it electrify, uh, we can use more efficiency, if, yeah, efficiently. And last one is the smaller propulsion system. It makes uh, increased space for the even the plane or the helicopters and crew members in the ships. So uh, let's get the self-power generation method under consideration. Uh, before I introduce about this, uh, I want to tell, I want to talk about this four is the under consideration. So for now, um, just anything or fixed it. So first one is the solar energy. Uh, it's like uh, utilize the white deck area in the carrier and uh, install the three type solar panels to make the power generations. 
And next is the wind energy uh, to build the wind turbines in the ships and while stationary position in the oceans and make the power generations. And third one is the ocean energy. It's like uh, build the tidal stream generator generators in the bowl or the hulls and make the produce, produce the electricity. And the last one is the hydrogen. Uh, it's like the electrolyze the sea water in the uh, in the operation to obtain the hydrogen, and from this hydrogen produce the electricity from the uh, through the fuel fuel cell system. Okay, uh, next is the timeline for ours. Uh, this is the summarized version of our timeline. We've been through the brainstorming and the exploration of topics and related trends. And also we selected the objective. And before the second presentation, we will do the specified object, our objective and do some mechanical analysis, like calculate the power energy for the proportions, something like that. And we have to do the pilot model creations. And next, the third, before the third presentation, we will do the development of the models and also the modified and evaluation of the models and also the finalization. And next is the job location. Uh, my name is Si Taeyang, as you can see. I'm the first presenter of the project and I researched on the sheep proportion system and the cell power generation methods. And I also do the calculation of the proportion <laughs> energy. And Jin Kim, uh, he is the second presenter of our film project. He researched on the current issues on the Korean light aircraft carriers, and he also do the model productions. And last, the Tech Jun Hwan, uh, he's the third presenter, and he researched on the aircraft carrier technologies and the legal frameworks. And he also do the suitability assessment and the model, pre model modifications. And this is the references for our first presentations. Uh, this is also my speech. Thank you for listening. Yes, good for other students. No question. Question from T. No? Mm -hmm. All right, and, uh, I'm happy to see the Navy that's so productive stuff. It is first time in, in my class that I will need it. Okay. Well, it looks like a big project for a three person, mm -hmm. a short term project. Need to focus on. I, Expected to be focused on proportion system, but at the final slide you said everything is covered by three percent yeah. separate So I I don't know. And question is uh, how many the size and speed is already fixed? Uh, maybe we focus on the light version, like. Uh, we guess uh, it's lighter than the, this eight. Mm, like forty, forty, forty eight, forty eight. Anyway, we you need to off. start from fixing the size and speed. Otherwise, you cannot start the proportion system. Right? Uh, proportion system. Yes. You need to find out how how big horsepower is needed. Yes. <laughs> We will do in the mechanical analysis. There's a type, but number of horsepower. You need to have a dimension and speed to calculate the horsepower. That's why I'm asking size is fixed. Anyway, yeah, and then aircraft. What kind of an aircraft and uh, how many of them will be served by the as I mentioned, it is also related with the size and speed. Yes, uh, as I mentioned before, the original CVX, the Korean project, has the 
plan for the 16 at 35 week plans. So we focus on that amount. So you, is it already fixed? Yeah. It's not fixed, but we focus on this amount. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You can go on to then team two. Yes. Hello everyone, my name is Kim Dori and I will present about our Sean project proposal. Our our team's topic is anti bio -pum. The table of contents is follows. It says follows. First, I will explain about the concept of the biofouling, and I will discuss why biofouling reduction technology is required. And then I will introduce the current technologies being used to reduce biofouling, and I will present our team's some project plan. First, I will introduce the concept of the biofouling. Well, biofouling is a compound word combining bio and fouling. Uh, and each word uh, refers to marine life and contamination or pollution. So bio fouling refers to the process where aquatic life, life forms accumulate and pollute from species. Now let's look at how bio fouling is formed. Uh, when a structure or surface is submerged, the surface absorb organic carbon and diatoms and bacteria settle on the surface. Then protozoa and macro algae first form microfouling. So the larger organisms attach to the surface and completing the microfouling process. The organisms shown in this illustration is are typical examples of the of those covering by fouling. As you know, it is including barnacles and mussels, silent algae and seaweed, etc. Among these barnacles are the most are considered the primary contributors to bio farming. Barnacles attached to the ship surfaces because they are large float in the in the ocean, eventually settling in areas with abandoned food. Once they are settled, they produce a strong cement like substance that can adhere them from it to the surface. The next session is covers some examples of why biofouling reduction technology are necessary. We have classified Let's classify the impact of biofouling into three categories on moving structures like ships and stationary structures and other effects. Uh, let's talk about the uh, impact of the moving structures. 
when biofouling occurs on the core of the ship, the surface roughness increases and it can result in increased uh, drag force and consequently higher fuel consumption. This data summarizes that the impact of the biofouling on GHG emissions, as known as uh, greenhouse gases. To summarize this graph, uh, even a right biofouling covering only 50% of the fuel can increase up to 25 increase in gas GHG emissions. Another example is that the US Navy spends one billion US dollar per year on anti-biofouling. One US destroyer is estimated to cost 56 million US dollar per year in increased fuel consumption due to the biofouling. Next, I will talk about the fixed objects. This is the profiling buoy, which is used to monitor meteorological parameters. It's significantly affected by biofouling. The main impact is include, included cutting corrosion and increasing the load and solar panel failure, sensor failure. And I'll talk about the other impacts. First, biofouling can lead the spread of the non-native species into new environments and organisms that attach it to the ship pool can travel across the oceans and reproduce in new ecosystems. Second, it can block cooling systems, which are essential for marine power plants, reducing their efficiency. Lastly, biofouling can decay marine structures, making them visually unappealing. The next session presents the current biofouling reduction technologies. Because of the significant impact of the biofouling, various technologies are being researched. The first method is about the use of products. As you can see from the image, different materials and technologies Techniques are used for coating. This research is ongoing to improve durability and reduce environmental impact. The second method is electrolytic antibiotic. <clears throat> this technique releases copper ions from the an from an anode using external power, creating a toxic environment for marine organisms. However, this method increases concern about the environmental pollution as excessive con concentration of copper can be harmful to other aquatic life. Lastly, there is a uh, ultrasonic method. This method is using ultrasound to prevent the, the initial formation of biofoil. When ultrasound is applied, the sound wave can form micro bubble or cause damage to the organisms. So it can prevent them from attaching to surfaces. This method is environmentally friendly, but has high energy consumption. Now let me talk, let me explain about the, our Tom project plan. This is our Tom project plan. Final, firstly, we plan to explore New approaches such as PNG or bio inspired method rather than focusing on the commercial available technologies. Once we decided our topic, we will design a system using these new, new technologies and conduct simulations. And we will compare fuel efficiency and the other effects aspect between our system and conventional systems. This is our reference page. And thank you for your attention. And do you have any questions? Yes. Thank you. Next presentation. Question from others.
can you explain more details about the popular uh, method? Uh, we have a big slide here. Okay. We have a uh, um, present here. T T A G. Yes. Uh, we just find some new tech emerging technologies to apply to our uh, antibody power, but I didn't know much about know much about things. I just know it used the tribal electric mechanism. Can be a candidate. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Another question. Okay. No question. You should have a question to evaluate them. Yeah. Right. My question is you may need to have a comparison table of different methods to find out single. Comparison table of one of them is this, right? And all the technologies, you yeah. already showed us three kind of one and four of them, right? You will find more. So you, you can make a comparison table to make a selection. All right, that's it. Thank you. See. Okay. <laughs> I'm still Just the introduction. First, I will explain about marine structure and marine structure efficiency and workflow and job cohesion. So, what is marine structure? The definition of marine structure is engineering facilities constructed and installed in the ocean for marine resources and continuous development. There's a lot of function of marine structure. First is uh, resource extraction, transportation, power generation, and defenses. Types of marine structure is two, there's two types of marine structure, floating marine structure and fixed marine structure. Floating mar marine structure is designed to remain unaffected by water depth and secured in position by mooring system while floating. A fixed marine structure is designed to be fixed on the stable with to withstand its own weight and environment loads. Uh, there's lots of natural disaster in Korea, such as earthquakes, and uh, the importance of regular safety inspection and maintain 
correctness of my system is increasing. For current system, there's a limitation of current system. By diving and boat, there's like safety problem, accessibility, accuracy, and regular inspection. So for this project, we are applying drone with sensors, like ultrasonic sensors, which is non-destructive test for underwater structure inspection. And it is effective in deep water. And an optical sensor for monitoring of shore platform, plus sea pipelines and wind turbines. And has advantage for long-term reliability monitoring. And for thermal, thermal imaging camera, the effective in detecting facts and collision. Employed and to, is employed to identify leak in plus C pipelines and for radar, a uh, large high, high capacity effort and detailed 3D data for monitoring marine infrastructure. And marine structures can be monitored in real time. So in this project, we are using, we are going to, we are planning to use drone and sensors. This is the workflow. The proposal presentation is to find subject and search reference of marine structure and search technologies for inspection. So after after that, in the midterm presentation, we are trying to decide about which structure to inspect and determine what kind of defect to inspect and to have discussion with of challenges to overcome in current inspection methods. At the final presentation, we're going to specification of inspection method and system and discuss the pros and cons of the proposed inspection method. This is the job allocation. I am the first presenter and we searched about current issues in marine structure inspection and development of solutions. Young Jun Cho is the second presenter and search the marine structures requiring in inspection and key inspection elements and search sensors used in marine structure inspection. And for the third presentation, Kang Min Chang is one of the people for it and it's one of design and evaluate evaluation of drone based inspection system. And this is the reference. And Okay, just from other No. Okay. No question? No. Ah. Presentation is too short, so that it is not easy to find out questions. Anyway, my question is. Uh, the inspection? Yeah. Is it inspection during construction of a structure or during operation of structure? Operation. Operational structure. In that sense, it, it, it will be uh, usually uh, offshore structure is located in far away the land, usually. Uh, somewhere and somewhere in up. I think, and for like in the deep water, there's like floating marine structures. And, right. Yeah. Can I see the uh, types of offshore structure you showed us? Okay. The previous one? Right. Okay. No, no. This one. This one. You're saying resources, extraction, transportation. What is the Structure, marine structure, including ship or uh, including ship. Okay, you're going to target one specific uh, structures. Power generation can be, but not marine, it's a floating part of right? Yes. And then defense, that's usually ship and something. You are including that. Again, during the operation. Well, very much. Ah, we are going fast, so we can do 
Team 5, are you available today? Yes, okay. Team 5, please. If we have a time on Thursday, we will have a class. So we have a remaining four. Not my presentation and my discussion, right? We can go to. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Song Bo Han, presenting for Team 4. I will now start our presentation for the Turley product. In today's world, data is everything. As we become increasingly data driven, the demand for data storage is growing exponentially. This growth is being driven by technologies like cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and big data. But with this rapid expansion comes significant challenges, particularly in terms of energy consumption and environmental sustainability. One innovative solution of these challenges is the concept of underwater data centers. The idea here is simple placing data storage infrastructure in ocean environments. By doing so, we can take advantage of the ocean's natural cooling properties, significantly reducing the energy required for cooling. Additionally, the ocean, ocean provides abundant space and renewable energy sources, making it an ideal environment for such systems. In this project, our goal is to explore the design and feasibility of underwater data centers. Let's begin by addressing two critical challenges that traditional data centers face, high energy consumption and excessive water usage. These are not only significant operational costs, but also major envi environmental concerns. Traditional data centers consume an immense amount of energy, with up to 30% of their energy being used solely for cooling. This is because the server generate heat and as they process and store data, and without proper cooling, overheating could lead to system failures. Now imagine leveraging this, the nature, the, the naturally cold temperatures of found in the ocean. Underwater data centers take advantage of this cold environment to cool servers naturally, drastically reducing the need for energy intensive air conditioning systems. This innovation can lead to significant energy savings and a much lower carbon footprint. Cooling isn't just about energy, it's also about water. Many traditional data centers rely on water-cooled systems, consuming vast amounts of fresh water to maintain optimal, optimal operating temperatures. In regions prone to drought and water scarcity, this high demand for water, place, water places additional stress on local, on local resources. In contrast, underwater data centers can use the ocean's abundant water supply for cooling, bypassing the need to draw from local freshwater sources. This not only re reduces operational costs, but also mitigates the environmental impact of freshwater supplies. Our proposed solution is the concept of underwater data centers for UDC. The idea behind UDC is straightforward. Place data storage infrastructures on the seabed or in ocean environments. By doing this, we can utilize the cold temperatures of the ocean for natural cooling, drastically reducing the energy required for traditional air cooling air conditioning systems. This concept also opens up opportunities to tap into renewable ocean-based energy sources such as wind, tidal, and wave power. A real-world example that demonstrates the feasibility of UDCs is Microsoft's Project Nikita. 
Launched in 2015, this project involved deploying a data center on the seafloor off the coast of Scotland. Over a two-year period, the underwater data center overcame challenge, several challenges, challenges including cryo fouling, and showed promising results such as deployment mm -hmm. under 90 days from decision power on. The, the success of Project Nati mm -hmm. proved that underwater data centers are not just a theoretical okay. concept, but a viable, scalable solution for the future of data storage. In our project, we aim to build on this foundation, exploring, exploring the design and further feasibility of water data centers, of underwater data centers, to solve the energy consumption and water usage challenges faced by traditional data centers. Now let's compare the two key examples of underwater data center projects. Microsoft's Project Critique and China's Highlander Underwater Data Center. Project Critique was a research initiative by Microsoft deploying a 12 rack data center off the coast of Scotland. It ran for two years, providing proving that underwater data centers can, more, can be more reliable. It utilizes seawater cooling and was powered entirely by renewable energy sources like wind and tidal. China's Highlander product is in the commercial phase with, with plans to deploy 100 units by 2025. Located near Hainan Island, it uses seawater cooling and is connected to the grid, with future plans to integrate wind and tidal power. The project plans to design a data center for the coast of South Korea with similar specifications using wind and tidal power for energy and aiming for com commercial use. The goal of our project is to design and analyze sustainable underwater data center that can be deployed along the coast of South Korea. We have three main objectives. Our goal is to create a data center structure that can handle the ocean's challenges like water pressure, corrosion, and stability. The structure will be designed to operate reliably underwater while minimizing long-term costs. We also aim to reduce the energy required for cooling by using seawater. We must analyze if this cooling system is feasible. Finally, we plan to power the data center using wind and tidal energy. So we, we will analyze whether these renewable energy sources can meet the, the data center's energy needs while keeping environmental, environmental impact low. For the midterm presentation, we'll, we will primarily, primarily focus on the conceptual design, conceptual design of our underwater data center. Our design will cover three key areas, the structure of the data center, the cooling methods we intend to use, potential power sources we will use. Regarding the power sources, we'll, we will focus on in integrating renewable energy, particularly wind and tidal power, given the total location. For the final presentation, presentation, we will present a more refined design and provide detailed analysis on cost and feasibility. We will, we will finalize the structural design of the data center with improvements based on the feasibility analysis and environmental factors. This design will include updated models and simulations of the cooling system and energy cons consumption. Comprehensive cost and estimates will be provided covering the materials construction and operational costs of the underwater data center. Our location selection focuses on the South Korean coastline identifying possible sites suitable for underwater data centers based on factors like water depth, distance to shore, and proximity to the renew renewable energy grid. My role in this project is the research on underwater data centers and the planning of the project. And Yunto will hand a midterm presentation. He will take the role of designing and conducting feasibility study for the cooling systems. Yunto will do the final presentation as well as cost analysis. He will also lead the implementation plan. Thank you for watching. Yes, John. Another thing. Yes. In the front of the name, in the front of the name means um, should the diver dive into the ocean, uh, dive into the underwater to the maintenance to the the um, the structure just that's one of the main concern uh, one of the main concerns of underwater data centers they usually uh, as shown here they usually have to uh, 
uh, bring the entire server out of the water in order to maintain the server. So if it is possible, maybe we will do some research on finding ways to make sure the servers are repairable underwater, but I think it's it will be easier to deploy it. It's the maintain, maintenance uh, routine is much simpler than just pouring out the water. Other questions? Uh, for the heat that a data center is going to create, is that going to have like environmental impacts? Can you, can you the, the, the heat, the heat. The heat from the computer, is that going to have an yeah, environment? Of course. So we're using the cold water from the sea, so it's going to heat up the ocean. But if you think about it, if you're using water from the ocean or from the rivers to cool traditional data centers, they're going to heat it up anyway. So I'm thinking, even though it's submerged in the water, the amount of if, if the amount of heat released from the data center is equal to traditional ones, I think the environmental impact will be similar, except for the fact that we don't have to actually draw the water away from the sources. We just we're just we're cooling it in the in the water the water source. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking that it depending on where the location is, it might affect the wildlife direct like um when you're putting water back into a river. You can always cool it back down before putting it back into the river. But if you have it directly in the ocean, then you can't cool on the ocean water before putting it back yeah, into the right. ocean. So it can affect a lot of the wildlife there. So I was just wondering if there's any way to like contain the heat or like track it so you, it doesn't go further than the um, um one thing one uh, idea that comes to mind is just use using cold water from for example under in like deep water, water, deep water, and then using that, cool it, and just like using the uh, heated up water and just sending it to the closer to the sea level. Because what you're saying is, if, if you use the river's water and cool it, and then cool the data center, and you're saying we can recool it, the <laughs> overheated water, and then put it back in the river, but that uses more energy. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I say that because I know that in the U.S., the, you're not allowed to release water back into the stream to get to a certain temperature. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't cool it down all the way, but it cools it down a certain amount before releasing it back in. It can't raise the temperature of the body of water by like more than a degree or it, it, a certain amount, right? So I'm saying it would be harder to regulate that while it's under while it's under water. That's that's what I'm saying. We'll make we'll make sure that we try to find out a way to make that. Part feasible, uh, like the example I just gave. Okay. Any questions? Um, yeah. I have a similar question. Um, so, um, if you put the data center right underneath the water, um, the top of the region right next to the data center will get the heat directly from the data center and increase the. I mean, the thing you said that in total the energy that is used. To operate the data set and pull it down, we get like lower than the traditional ones. But the thing is, in the tropical region, the heat would directly go to nearby waters and then change the habitat of wildlife. It will. But what I'm saying is, even in traditional data centers, the heat is not going anywhere. It's it's going either outside through air, heated air, or outside through heated water. So the total amount of heat removed from the from the data center is equal. We're just now changing that to 100% water. Yeah, but the thing I'm saying is, like in the traditional ways, you put the heat where nothing lives, like industrial areas. But if you put that but directly underwater, fish and other wildlife would be living. So you're just putting something in somebody else's house. Yeah, that will directly affect the environment. So that will also. Okay, I, I, I need to stop this discussion because of the time. You may uh, prepare answers to his questions, to the questions next time. You tell me presentation, right? And then we can continue this question. All right, other final question. TA? No? All right, my question was uh, oh, the conference table between. Right. Two things, but well, you don't need to answer. 
one thing I found that 35 meter is something meaning. Does it have any meaning? We may not have a solution, so next time you can answer to me. The other question is, what is the size of energy you need to cool it down? Similar question. You don't have any size of energy. How many energy you need to cool, cool down? It is important, right? Okay, thank you very much. You are then Muslim world. No other than so when I didn't know. Why did you say this is group five, and my name is Mary Cho. Uh, our topic is dust estimation and reconstruction of undersea terrain to estimating flow using CFD. Yeah. You know about this, uh, almost uh, over 80% of the ocean are explored because it is too large and the, the region where ocean are unexplored to have a very compl complicated structure. So it is very hard to explore using ship or submarine. So we are using robot to research here, but, you know, robot is still developed and also it is very expensive to, to use and explore, explore all the place where unexplored it. And so still human explore undersea many, in many cases, like a ocean, ocean cave or somewhere like a deep uh, blue hole where the very deep place. So, but there is many danger to research, explore here. Like a, like a, someone who in danger in blue hole, many, oh my God. Okay, I'm <laughs> so when that body in the blue hole, we human explore the undersea. So in that in many cases, uh not many cases, but sometimes the rescue some of person who tried to rescue also died together, like the nitrogen, and nitrogen addiction or, or very complicated structure. So what we will do is the try to use a robot and explore the very small and narrow narrow place, but. We cannot develop the robot now, so we try to make algorithm to reduce the cost to make robot more cheaper. So recent under CS to making we use solar, RGB camera, or LiDAR or radar, but we try to use RGB camera. And why need to use RGB camera? First is very cheap. 
the, the most important region for our topic because like a lighter is a lighter price for the undersea exploration is fifty thousand to one hundred thousand dollar and sonar have a price at ten thousand to five hundred thousand just think the under of them is uh is the place in the website that sell the of the lighter or sonar to explore undersea. The new cost is to seven five K dollar and and the sonar is one hundred ten K dollar. But but the there is a uh like commerce that is our commerce. It is pressure resident to three thousand meter but it cost only two thousand dollars and also FHD. And uh, the next region is high resolution. Like the lighter have a very low resolution. The layer there is two resolution for the lighter, the upside down and the horizontal level. Upside down mm, resolution say layer resolution. The lighter lighter layer resolution is 16, 32, 64, 128. It is, it uses only 16 channel to, to, to check, check the place using, using laser to, to create new image. And, and second is sonar is not say resolution, just is say like a telescope, angular resolution. It is 0 0.1 degree to one degree, but just find that that side. We in the art color, I art color for the undersea, which can use under the sea is FHD, KHD, or okay. So. And, and second and uh, third reason is scan multiple data and it is real time. Lighter and sooner only can get distance data. No color data can bounce. So and also sonar needs time to express the next frame, but lighter and arch color is can get data in real time so also lidar have a very slow brain link because there is two type of lidar that scanning or spotting but both are very low brain link so i i get a video of them like a Lighter, it have low rate and uh, very very low resolution uh, resolution for the upside down, and uh, I cannot find the sonar image for to but on uh, but you can find on um, YouTube the sonar image but I I can't uh I it is, I think it is not. Uh, it is not sufficient to this product, so I just get a pseudo Im image of the. So it looks like this. So it has very low frame rate and uh, very low resolution. So so Our project plan is for improving model to estimate depth accurate, accurate and train it to make use of underwater environment using RGB camera. But it has a challenge, challenge that 
limitation that insufficient amount of training data and low quality of real data. And second, based on this estimated depth data, modeling the undersea train parent and uh, but it have a occlusion problem because the archery camera only can see the what only trunks side and we don't know the back side of it. So mm. so we turn to solve this problem later and reducing and filtering noise of the deficit information and bird is using CFD estimate the flow of the undersea. So this is our final goal. So so this app also I want to say how we can use this algorithm. First is autonomous robot. In this day autonomous robot which can explore the deep sea is very a lot but they are very expensive and it is hard because of the sensor is very high price. So we, we try to make uh, another way to reduce the cost. And second thing is fluid estimation and the current reconstruction of the rough environment, which I say just before, like a cave or ocean cave or deep, very deep blue hole or some are very narrow, so we can use it like that. So we analyze the ocean environment because the flow, the flow of the small and narrow lakes, uh, ocean flow is highly related to ocean environment. So we can give we can give another one more data to to. Uh, analyze the ocean environment and uh, also the kind of the parent parent or the parent the parent of the region is very important for the ocean eco ecosystem so um, we can it is very important to develop our algorithm. So this is our schedule of the project, like finding idea and uh, just and uh, what we should, what what can we do to solve this problem and find the this is and second is collecting data set and the ver and verification and training vision model and third is analyzing. Fluid, fluid flow using CFD. This, uh, and this is our job on KPM. Um, I'm first present taker, and uh, my role is the training vision AI and the data treatment. And the uh, one chain is second presentation taker, and uh, he will modeling the state of region and flow analysis using CFD and. Uh, Artemis uh, will be third presentator and uh, collect both our tourism and the verification the data which we made. And this is our reference and uh, appendix, there is an appendix that we, I make a kind of vision framework, like a, it is too long, so I say short. So just uh, like um, because of the like data, we will play synth synthetic data set using 3D game and the uh, training model and uh, the training the parent model and uh, give a real data and make a child model and the syntax select labeling of real data and generate uh, generate Using that generated data, we'll fine tuning the model, and the last model will be used. And we will make a data set using this. And thank you for your attention.
about the light penetrations. So you guys plan to use the RGB cameras, right? So and I know the sonar and the later lighter use the infrared wavelengths lights. So it can penetrate through the oceans and it can catch the the place, the shape of the place, but so only for the RGB camera there's need the uh, more lights or secondary lights for ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、